All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Derek Hoy, and I am the Program Officer for Veterans Health here at the New York Health Foundation. I'd like to first start off by thanking you all for joining us today. I'm coming to you live from our headquarters in New York City, so it is with honor and gratitude that I acknowledge the land itself and the Lenape people who have stewarded it for countless generations over the course of 400 years before being displaced. I'm very excited to be in conversation today with our incredible guest, Jesse Gould. He is the founder and CEO of the Heroic Hearts Project, a former Army Ranger and all-around fascinating human being. So just chatting with him in general would yield an insightful discussion, but I'm thrilled to be speaking with him specifically about a rather nascent appearing topic that is at least centuries, if not you know, millennia old. So that being the usage of psychedelics as medicine. But before we jump into the conversation, I'd like to first start off with a few housekeeping notes. We'd love to hear from you all throughout the course of the conversation, so feel free to send any questions into the chat box whenever you like, and I'll try to sneak in as many as I can during the flow of the conversation. Also, feedback and engagement in general is welcome, so you can send us comments or share any contact info you'd like in there as well. For our hearing impaired attendees like myself or anyone else in need of live stream captioning, you can click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then select the show sub subtitles and or full transcript options there. And lastly, just a heads up, this webinar is being recorded, so we'll be sure to send out an event recap email with a link to the video that will be sent to everyone in the next few days, so be sure to keep an eye out for that. And without further ado, I'm excited to kick off this conversation and get things started. First, by thanking you, Jesse, for joining us today. How are you, sir? Good, Derek. Thanks so much for uh, setting this up. Long time coming, so thrilled to be talking about this in front of your audience. Absolutely. Very, very glad to have you here. Uh, I thought to start, I wanted to give a little backstory for the audience. Uh, Jesse, you and I have a wonderful mutual friend, Amanda Burrill, who is literally one of the most impressive people I've met. If folks joining us today don't know her, she's a form former naval officer and is amazing at a ton of different things, but one in particular is sharing her journey and educating folks about her mental and physical rehab stemming from a few different head injuries she's attained throughout the years. So if folks in the audience are interested, you know, be sure to check her out. I think she has a book coming out soon, some more details on that to follow. But she and I were catching up a few months ago, and she mentioned this incredible guy, started this nonprofit that is helping vets heal with the use of psychedelics, which really piqued my interest for a few reasons. So she put me in touch with him, and I'm really glad she did enter you. So uh, can you first start off by telling us a bit about what this nonprofit is that you started and what is its mission? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the nonprofit's name is Heroic Hearts Project, and we are a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization. Uh, started, it's, it's registered in Florida, but I'm here in uh, New York in Harlem. Uh, and so this is where I live currently with my wife. Um, and essentially, the, the main goal of Heroic Hearts Project is to connect military veterans to psychedelic based healing. Uh, so the veterans that come to our doors are ones that typically have gone through Department of Veteran Affairs, the VA's mental health system, uh, generally speaking, to limited avail. And so they've been years, if not decades, in traditional talk therapy, all kinds of SSRIs and medications, and just come to the spot where, you know, they're starting to lose hope or they've just had this sort of grayness or, or weight in their life for so long, which can lead to financial ruin, can lead to um, relationship issues, uh, isolation um, and, and so it's, it's, there really is a huge crisis in the veteran community, I think a broader community around mental health right now, and the current accepted mental health treatments through the VA and broadly are just not working. They're not working to the, the, the capacity. Fortunately, uh, we're seeing with psychedelics, as, as, as odd as that sounds, or as uh, radical as that sounds, psychedelics are, are really leading the way in providing healing modalities. Uh, they're, they're really showing to be effective with PTSD, depression, anxiety, addiction across the board. Uh, so it's a really kind of, I wouldn't say novel science because it's been around and it's been researched, but it's, it's really revamped in recent years. So our program, uh, essentially we provide a whole container of support, starts off with education. Um, we're not trying to, you know, give psychedelics to everybody. We're trying to provide another tool for those that are really in need. We do uh, support, we do coaching, uh, all the retreat centers we work with are, are vetted, are safe, and then aftercare, something called integration that we can get into more uh, during this conversation. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, and there's so much in what you just said that revolves around uh, a few words that that you know we're using a lot more these days. Uh, healing, you know, uh, certainly looking at community, peer support, etc. Uh, and and they're super impactful and, and worthy of dis dissecting. And, and we will uh, here in a bit. But before we get into that, I'd like to take a step back, if you will, to better understand how you you ended up doing this work. Um, I love asking veterans why they joined the military for, for two reasons. One, because their answers like almost always rhyme. Uh, it, it's very similar. Uh, but two, despite that, they're rarely, if ever, like the same answer. Uh, so could, could you tell us, you know, why you in particular joined, what your time in the service was like, and then how you ended up getting into this work specifically? Absolutely. So I, I have a little bit of a, an otter track into the military, not in a conventional way. I actually started off uh, going financial route, uh, graduated from Cornell University with a degree in economics. Uh, I was doing internships and eventually worked at small uh, investment banks in, in New York on Wall Street. Um, and I ended up joining the military, I ended up enlisting. Uh, the reasons being, so there's, there's a culmination of factors as any great decision always is. Uh, I actually graduated in 09, which was the height of the financial collapse. Still was able to find jobs, uh, but it just really highlighted um, sort of the system I was getting into. I loved finance, but it also, that was a, a, a crisis caused by greed, essentially. And getting out of college, I kind of just felt there's this missing piece to me. I, I wanted to get back. I felt very fortunate having gone to this great school and having all these prospects um and i just didn't feel one i didn't feel like i was i had reached that level of being a man or being an adult i i, I needed that sort of coming of age uh dynamic that i thought was going to come about through college just never happened and then here i also wanted to give back uh have some sort of purpose beyond myself and again that wasn't showing and the military always intrigued me just sort of that challenge that is very unique to the military and so I think this culmination of forces of like, hey, Wall Street's burning right now. It's not going anywhere. If I actually want to do this, it's, you know, put up, shut up kind of moment. Mm -hmm. And so I just made that decision uh, after talking with my family. It was like, this is something I want to do. And this is uh, an avenue of life that I want to explore. So I uh, went into the recruiter, um, figured out what the best step was. I ended up doing enlistment to pretty much start at the very bottom. And I went uh, through basic. Uh, became an army ranger so going through selection I was stationed at first battalion 75th ranger regiment savannah georgia and then over the course of my time in i did three combat deployments to afghanistan um, i became a non-commissioned officer so a leader in charge of at the end of it 30 or so uh, junior rangers training in both overseas operations um, and generally speaking, over the course of my military career, I, I got a lot out of it. It was the challenge I needed. It was the self-affirmation, self-confidence that I was looking for that I couldn't put my finger on. And really, you know, one of the most direct ways to kind of learn leadership and about yourself, about other people. So when I got out with this degree in finance and then for the Ranger background, I thought I was going to hit the ground running. And professionally, I did pretty well, found, you know, good jobs and had great career prospects, but internally that's when the mental health issues started catching up and started hitting the, the normal veteran mental health uh, checklist of um, things not going right, depression, bad anxiety, abusing alcohol, not able to have healthy relationships, um, all sorts of things. And so I found myself in a situation where on the outside, I was like, you're doing everything right, but on the inside, it was just I felt this, there's this ever present darkness, this dark cloud that I, no matter what I did, I couldn't get past it. And so I tried, you know, many holistic things, changing my life, diet, all this kind of stuff. They helped to a limited degree, uh, but I was still in this spot and just kind of going downhill little by little, try to go through the VA. Um, you know, it, it was just very apparent one that they were overburdened. They had too many people. Um, and two is really a fast track towards medication. It was kind of within the, the initial 30 minutes of conversation of like what, what medications can, uh, can I become on that can help with these issues and not really a discussion of getting over what I was going through, you know, it was labeled as PTSD, but more of like, this is your life. How are you going to maintain this? So I walked away from that with, you know, kind of really hit that 
took away the the hope or the prospects of like this can't be it like there has to be a way to resolve this um and fortunately around that time i heard about these psychedelic retreats that were going on in south america dated back thousands of years something called ayahuasca um and i had never done psychedelics at that time if you had asked me i probably would have said i would live my whole life without ever doing psychedelics it just didn't appeal to me at all had no interest i didn't see how a psychedelic could help me where where i was at it just seemed like something that would just pile on but at the same time, you know, whatever I was doing and whatever the professionals were recommending also wasn't working. Mm. And so eventually, um, I think that kind of comparison eventually fell through and was like, all right, well, I clearly am not making the right choices. So let's take this leap of faith and see what this is about. Because the more research I did, the more it intrigued me that there was something going on. And mm. also just given the cultural perspective of it. Um, it wasn't just, you know, doing drugs for the fun of it. There's ceremony, there's history, there's, there's a dynamic to it that uh, appealed to me. Yeah, uh, you touched on so much there. And I really appreciate you sharing that uh, for, for a lot of reasons. I think one in particular, you know, reintegrating into and, and, and readjusting to a new environment um, is something that we hear a lot. And it's so wild that that's a pretty new phenomenon in like human existence, if you will, for ages, you know, you were always with your tribe, clan, village for the most part. Um, but things are different now. And, and, and we're seeing this, um, you know, not only in the vet space, which I, I think is worth pointing out. Uh, there was a, uh, some research done that looked at the reintegration of Peace Corps volunteers. Uh, and one in four experienced depression um, once they're reintegrating. And for the folks that were evacuated from a host country during wartime or some other kind of emergency, those rates are, are, are twice as high. And, and there are countless examples of indigenous Americans that, you know, witness and address these issues of reintegration, especially after war. Uh, you know, the Papago tribe uh, would have a 16 day purification ritual after combat that the whole, like literally the whole tribe would take part in. Lakota, Cheyenne, Kiowa tribes all did something similar. And that end goal was always, you know, the same communal healing. So I want to get back to one of those words I mentioned, uh, I think a lot of this work revolves around and, and that being healing, you mentioned it. Uh, so J Jesse, how do you define healing and, and what role does the Heroic Hearts Project play in helping veterans heal? Yeah, uh, and that's a really good question. I mean, I think definitions are are very important. And I kind of touched on this before. I think one part of this issue is that we define trauma and mental health in a very limited perspective. And even uh, if you look at PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, it's become really a rubber stamp. And so veteran with any, with a wide range of mental health issues tend to just get labeled PTSD and tend to be treated in the same sort of way, have sort of the same um, sort of a medication uh, or trail going forward. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're seeing so, so many bad results. The same sort of thing is we're, we're seeing like what you said, like it, it could just be um, this isolation, this hardness and, and reintegration. There's head trauma involved. There's all sorts of different dynamics that go into men med veteran mental health disorders. And if we just label it in one sort of dynamic as PTSD, it's a disservice and you know, the results we see are not surprising. Same thing with, with healing um, and how we treat mental health. Uh, I think we, we always try to compare it almost like a, a physical ailment. You know, like if I break my bone, what's normal is when I'm healed, right? What, if, and that goes by a certain protocol. You go to the doctor, okay, let's see how bad the break is, blah, blah, blah. We'll reset it, we'll put you in a cast. You'll take these medications. You'll do this physical therapy. You know, uh, it takes specialty, but it's, it is pretty scripted at this point. And we've been treating mental health the same way, but it's such more complex. And this is what we tell people is just because you overcome trauma, just because you overcome some sort of really bad instance in your life that caused PTSD does not necessarily mean that you're doing well either. And so just because we get people to the baseline of no PTSD does not mean that their lives are great either. And so... Uh, healing, you know, we, we have to kind of define what that means. Does it mean just get to a baseline where you're not having these traumas or does it mean to where we can like, how's your wellness of life, right? Is that the true meaning of healing? And that's a, I think a discussion worth having. And there's actually new surveys coming about that are not just testing 
whether we're over our trauma, depression, PTSD, but also how well we're actually interacting with life in, in a lot of different dynamics. And that, again, is one of the unique, intriguing parts of psychedelics is that what we're seeing versus other medications, uh, other medications like SSRIs tend to, um, for some people, and I'm, I'm not demonizing them, they, they definitely can save lives. There's definitely a time and place, but for a lot of people, it tends to just sort of mute certain dynamics in them so that they're not as reactive. Um, so they don't have these outbursts or they don't have these swings in personality. It kind of keeps them in this even keel, which can also, you know, be to the detriment of other great parts of their personality or their, their, their enjoyment of life. And so it, it kind of, it does that sort of, for a lot of people, they'll describe it as numbing them or, or making things a little bit kind of more gray. Where psychedelics, we see people actually overcoming, having to confront their um, mental health, their traumas, but then also it gives them these tools to better appreciate, better value, and actually um, explore life with content, no happiness, because it tends to bring these feelings of purpose, connectivity, um, self-love, all these things that are sort of missing factors in our current mental health system right now. Uh, Jesse, you touched on so much there. I wanted to like throw the clapping hands emojis up like 20 times. Uh, but, I, you know, so much you said, it, you know, really resonates. And I think that's something just for my own personal uh, journey. I When I was able to like process my trauma, like mentally, I understood what happened, where it came from, et cetera. I was still taken aback by the fact that like, I still didn't necessarily feel better. Um, and I think uh, Bessel van der Kolk uh, wrote a great book, uh, The Body Keeps a Score. And I think that's what really helped it resonate for me is that my body was still you know, holding this trauma, even though like mentally I'd process, I could talk about it and all that stuff, but I wasn't feeling better. And that's when I really understood the difference between like you were saying, you know, numbing some of these things or, you know, being okay, but are you healed? Uh, so I really appreciate you, you really, um, you know, explaining a lot of that. And, you know, I originally asked because, you know, uh, I learned how important the role of defining a term was when we at the foundation were doing some work to uh, create universal access to veterans treatment courts, we got really bogged down in defining the term veteran, which we all, you know, more or less kind of knew what a veteran was. Uh, but there was so much at stake, depending on how inclusive or exclusive the term was. So we had to boil it down. But if you'd asked me a few years ago, uh, if that would have mattered, I, I, don't, I would have said no, I don't see how. Um, so kind of similarly, I think the idea of, you know, how we define what a drug is, can, can have comparable consequences. Dr. Carl Hart, Carl Hart, the chair of Columbia University's Department of Psychology, he, he points out that the way we've classified certain drugs, you know, historically one prevented us from meaningfully investing in the research that would help us better understand, uh, you know, the benefits of certain substances. But then on top of that, you know, it creates this stigma. Um, and, you know, it's really hard for a lot of people to, to think that these drugs that, you know, have told us can cause harm and are very dangerous, can also have medicinal benefits. I think cocaine is actually a shockingly good example of this. It's still used in certain medical procedures to this day, but we still have the drug war crack kind of epidemic, um, you know, talking points in our heads. So it's hard to reconcile that. So one of the other objectives to bring it back to your work of Heroic Hearts Project is to develop and contribute to the growing base of psychedelic research. So what does the research you know, actually show us um, about the usage of psychedelics? You touched on a little bit of it, uh, but specifically regarding treating mental health issues. Yeah, and you brought up some good points yourself as well. And uh, in terms of finishing up the other question, where Heroic Hearts comes in is we, veterans who are seeking this healing, we provide them containers of support to where they can access it safely. Uh, again, these are powerful substances, so it's not to be taken lightly. There are certain procedures we recommend, a set and setting are super important. You're dealing with uh, some pretty heavy trauma, and so the person needs to feel supported uh, and, and safe in those environments. And so that's how we provide um, and really checking on, on contraindications, all this kind of stuff. Um, and and to, to what you're saying with, with the word, you know, drug and how we define that, we, we actually come across that because we do a lot of policy work here in New York, um, California, and oftentimes we had this, I just had this conversation in California with a statewide politician, a representative, and they were worried that, hey, if we uh, change the policy on, on psychedelics, uh, they were, their mind immediately went to like, hey, 
LA already has a bad homeless population, right? And a lot of them uh, are on drugs. Uh, a lot of them have their life have deteriorated from that. And so they're like, oh, well, if now we have psychedelics in the street, is this going to make the homelessness worse? And again, you see sort of this line of reasoning of drugs, you know, the dare drugs is is all bad. And if any of them get released, then it all, automatically it's going to affect the youth. It's going to add to homelessness. It's going to add to all the, the negative sides of, you know, what we're seeing with like met, meth epidemics and fentanyl and all that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. the point there was, well, one, psychedelics are not a substance of high abuse. And I, I doubt the vast majority of people on Skid Row are there because of a psychedelic experience, nor are actively taking psychedelics. Like that's not the root of the problem. Sure. And two, we view these people as drug addicts, right? We do view them as like vagrants and bad parts of society. They made bad decisions. It's somewhat their fault. But if you look at, if you were to interview most of those people, a lot of the addiction or even homelessness stems from a mental health issue. We do have a mental health issue in this country and it's easier to sort of sweep it under the rug, ignore this than to actually understand of like, they're probably there or they probably followed this path for uh, certain reasons that if we just treat it like addiction, like that they're people that made bad decisions or that they're bad people, we're not going to heal it. But if we view it as, hey, this is a mental health issue, how do we come about that? How do we prevent that? Then I think we can actually prevent this homelessness, which benefits everybody, right? Like, and the drug addiction that benefits everybody. People generally don't grow up as kids wanting to be drug addicts or wanting to be homeless. Uh, so, you know, part of what we were doing, because there's still a lot of stigma around this, we, we hit sort of this pathway in many different ways. So one, there's a huge problem. If you're not aware, you know, the estimates for veteran suicide range anywhere from 15 to 22 veterans commit suicide every day. The numbers far surpass those that have been killed in combat. If with the Afghanistan and Iraq campaigns, I think the number is around 10 to 11,000 that were killed in combat, obviously very tragic. The numbers are in the hundreds of thousands for those that have taken their own life. And those statistics are actually really hard to pin down. So likely it's a lot more. And you're seeing the same thing with first responders, firefighters, there's huge suicide problems there. Um, and just mental health in general of how many prescriptions, if you look at the, how many prescriptions the VA gives out, it's not rare for people to come to our door that are on 10 different medications, which should be a clear indication that we're not doing something right. There should be no reason that you need 10 uh, medications that affect how your brain function. There, there, there's clearly something wrong there. So part of that is we have a huge amount. Our wait list is over um, 1,200 veterans right now, just in the past uh, I think 12 months, we got over 600 new applicants. It's only going to increase exponentially. So there's a huge problem and we're really in this triage situation. So our main function is to connect as many as we can safely to modalities that are actually showing to be effective. The other side is we do need the research. We need, do need to back it up, right? We need stats. We need figures. The hard part with research up to this is um, after the there was a re- original research in the 60s. Um, but because of the war on drug and sort of a reaction to um, different issues and a lot of it actually stemmed in racism, uh, the research and drugs pretty much got completely shut off. They became schedule one and anybody who even mentioned uh, psychedelics in psychi- psychiatry or academia were pretty much blacklisted. So since the 60s onwards, uh, really until you know the past 10 to 20 years, there's been really no research into psychedelics. Fortunately, because of organizations like MAPS who have been studying MDMA under Rick Doblin, uh, it's starting to reemerge and people are starting to almost rediscover, for lack of a better word, this. Um, But it's been so hard, it's so expensive. Uh, MAPS uh, with the MDMA, it's showing, uh, it's got declared a breakthrough therapy for PTSD uh, the, the results are well above and beyond anything else we've, we've tried. 67% success rate in treatment-resistant PTSD, so the hardest cases. MDMA is likely to be prescribable by therapists next year. Uh, all of that was crowdsourced money. So hundreds of millions of dollars had to come from donations, not a cent came from the government. So that kind of gives you an idea of how hard it is to study these substances. Uh, so we're trying to contribute to that literature because there's a lot more research just 
to understand it, to break the stigma, then, but also so we can provide better services of, we have a better sense of who and uh, what situations this works best with. And so we're working with the University of Texas, Austin, which is significant, you know, a psychedelic center in Texas with the Dell Medical School. We worked with the University of Georgia. Um, we're working with a, a, a English or a, a college in the UK, Imperial College of London, and then University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, we're also uh, starting to do a study with uh, Columbia uh, here in New York. So this is happening. Uh, every major, I wouldn't say every, but the vast majority of major universities that you've heard of are studying this. Um, Johns Hopkins, you know, the probably the best, one of the best medical schools in the world has their own psychedelic center. And the reason is because the results that are coming from these studies are significant, are significantly better, are actually surprising the researchers of how well they're working. Um, and so, for instance, I said MDMA, psilocybin, so the chemical in, in mushrooms and what people call magic mushrooms, uh, mm -hmm. that's been declared a breakthrough therapy for depression. Um, and this is across the board. We're just seeing some phenomenal results with these psychedelics. So the top medical schools are, are signing on to it because we've been in such like a, the current mental health options have been so lackluster mm -hmm. and it's just building up of how many people are on them for years and years. And so now that we're finally seeing things that actually not only help, but help people overcome and possibly thrive in life, um, it's it's it is changing as we speak the mental health landscape. Yeah, and you're definitely seeing it now because I think there's this you know stark contrast between the way, like you mentioned, we we looked at substance abuse issues and, and kind of drugs, if you will. Um, and and I think what you said was was really great in in in, in a lot of ways. It's kind of one looking at what we know doesn't work, uh, and certainly incarcerating folks. There's no evidence that shows that that helps with addiction or, you know, as rehabilitative, you know, is actually, you know, quite the opposite. Um, and a lot of these approaches we've taken don't work. Um, you know, SSRIs, there's really no long-term study that's showing that they're effective. Um, and then on top of that, you know, exercising uh, can be, or being outside can be just as, or more effective than SSRI. So we know certain things that aren't working for the most part, um, but it's good to see what is. And I think, you know, the research that you mentioned, uh, seeing that um, you know, become more common knowledge. I think it's great. Uh, you know, so I'm glad there's objective research that's starting to replace a lot of these war on drug myths. But I, I gotta say, I like, I find it super frustrating. And you kind of mentioned this, um, that it's not like this is like new research per se. It's more really reconfirming a lot of stuff that had already been done. And I remember reading this article in Vanity Fair in like 2010, and it was um, discussing Cary Grant's use of LSD in the 50s. Uh, and everyone, like hundreds of actors, were using LSD um, in, um, in in therapeutic environments. So there was someone who would prescribe it, they would sit there and kind of do what we consider trip sitting now. Uh, and, you know, Cary Grant would wax poetic about how helpful it was for him and all these people. And there was a little research being done then. And like you mentioned, nothing since then. So it, it's popping up again now, which, which I'm glad. But I think, it, you know, um, in similar vein, despite us knowing much more, uh, not only about psychedelics in general, but especially their ability to heal. Are there still some myths that are, you know, that prevail regarding these substances? Um, and, and how does that impact your work? Yeah, there, there's still entrenched sort of beliefs. Um, I mean, we're, we're fortunate. There's a lot of veterans uh, just because of the efficacy that have really become strong advocates for this. And the veteran voice has proven to be a very powerful tool especially in, pol in uh, policy and, and talking to politicians um, because, you know, I mean, they're the ones that vote for the wars or, or initiate the war. So they better, you know, support the veterans. Um, I hope that if they didn't, that would, you know, have some negative backlash, but I think they all see that they're like, they can't, they have to, in some, in the least, <laughs> in the least uh, risky form, they have to back veterans where they can. Uh, and so it's actually shown to be a pretty bipartisan bill to date. And you have some pretty strange bedfellows where, you know, you have AOC in one corner, Dan Crenshaw in another corner. We just had a bill that was backed by Cory Booker and Rand Paul. Uh, so you're, you're getting some pretty diverse people uh, backing this. Um, and the, the veteran voice has, has really sort of led that. But no matter what, I mean, 
the propaganda of the war on drugs has proven to be very effective. There's just, if I say psychedelics, most people are going to have that instant sort of like, oh, I know what that means. It's going to go back to the 70s. It's going to go back to like, you know, kind of more chaotic uh, aspects or societal degradation. There's still a very entrenched. Uh, I was just talking to my dad about you know, um, current like job crisis and all this kind of stuff. And there's still this entrenched thing that people will give if given the opportunity, just smoke pot all day and lay on their couch or do drugs. And it's going to, you know, lead to this kind of stuff. So there's still that kind of perspective of, uh, how humans are. I think it kind of relates to that addiction, uh, dynamic, uh, that I talked to earlier. So it's really educating. It's, it's showing, I think things like, um, Michael Pollan's uh, book, How to Change Your Mind, and the current Netflix documentary based off of that, as well as organizations like Johns Hopkins, Stanford, uh, changing it. Um, but the very fact that a bill passed in Texas is, is showing the tides are shifting. So you're never going to convince 100% of the people, but I think we're finally getting to it. And at the end of the day, I think it's also a generational thing. You know, the, there's sort of the famous idea in academia and research that um, you know, uh, changes and, and, or paradigm shifts happen a generation at a, at a time. It, the other, the previous generations kind of have to die out before academia can kind of move on. And so I think generation people, my age, especially veterans, my age tend to be much more open to it than maybe older generations, just because that's what they, you know, they had their own perspectives, uh, with this. Um, and so it is starting to change, you know, we don't have direct connection to, 60s or 70s so we don't have our entrenched beliefs there and so we're just kind of seeing the results so i think as uh my ear pod fell out as this stuff matures and as a generation start to shift i think that's going to be more of the case um and i think there, there's 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 a stigma across the board you know there's a stigma with with that with drugs with how mental health is like i said i think we, we treat it more like a physical ailment so i think perspectives and mental health need to change. And then a big one too, which we're seeing uh, kind of fight out in psychedelics right now, is we kind of alluded to this. Um, a lot of these traditions where, whether it's mushrooms, whether it's ayahuasca, whether it's iboga, uh, they date back thousands of years. You know, a large percentage of early tribal cultures use some sort, form of psychedelic, generally speaking, mushrooms. Uh, as healing, spiritual healing, physical healing, mental healing, very common. Um, it wasn't until they were purged through culture that they became kind of underground. And so, and in their own way, they evolved, they, they evolved in their own essentially psychedelic pro uh, scientific process, right? Like they, they developed over the courses of, of hundreds, if not thousands of years to be used in very specific ceremonies, very specific manners that predate the FDA, that predate NIH, that predate all this kind of stuff. But the Western um, medical model is very specific. Uh, and so unless there's, you know, unless it goes through the FDA process, unless we can identify the precise chemical that has a precise reaction in the precise situation, it's very hard to get it into this modern sort of idea. And so that's kind of one of the, the friction points that we're hitting now is there's a lot of people that just want to medicalize psychedelics. So they're accepting that they're, they're mm -hmm. there, but mm -hmm. then you will have to go to a doctor or a therapist, somebody that's gone that has those credentialing and that's the only way you can do it. So mm -hmm. essentially taking it from sort of these ceremonial indigenous sides and be like, no, well, this is the only way you can do it, you know? And so that's going to be problematic. So in my mind, I want that to be available. If somebody wants to go to a doctor, they should be able to do that, but that shouldn't come at the sacrifice of how this has generally been done in sort of communal uh, styles. And of course it's gonna be, how does this look in the US? We want safety controls. We want um, people who know what they're doing there, but we have to kind of figure it out. Does somebody need an eight year degree to do sort of communal psychedelics? Mm -hmm. I'm kind of of the opinion that that's not necessary. It takes different things. But I do think for instance, in the ayahuasca tradition, there's an apprentice master sort of situation where people work with these substances for decades and then they become, then they become the healers. So I think there does need to be some sort of, I wouldn't want, you know, Joe down the street to lead an ayahuasca ceremony for a group of veterans. Um, so that, these are the discussions we need to have 
And that's such the problem with um, prohibition, with making these things illegal, because not only does it limit access to them, but it actually makes them more dangerous. And it also prevents conversations for us to make a better infrastructure. So psychedelics, whether people like it or not, are here to stay. They are already entrenched in the men mental health model, but we're doing ourselves a disservice with the laws because by the time this does shift or they go through the FDA, we're going to be grossly unprepared. The infrastructure is not there yet. We don't have enough therapists that are trained to work with it. We don't have the understanding of how this is going to mesh with our culture, uh, what the regulations are. And so we're waiting till the very last drop until it's inevitable. And that's just going to make all of this um, bring much more friction. It's going to make it, you know, worse for everybody, which is how we tend to, you know, we, we tend to not react until we absolutely have to. And then that's the worst case scenario. So that's part of our advocacy of like, hey, let's listen to the writing on the wall. This is coming. So what can we do now to do appropriate steps? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And and similarly, just a lot of great info there. And I appreciate you sharing that. Um, you know, I think there is something about these recurring myths that are just super hard to shake. Um, uh, I think uh, during the Depression, you know, folks jumping out of windows, uh, it's, it didn't really happen. Uh, you know, it's not documented. Maybe two folks in, in Wall Street, um, you know, did die by suicide, but the suicide rates were already increasing uh, before the crash. There's like no, you know, causation here. Um, I think similarly, uh, Vietnam veterans being, you know, spit on at the airport, like that didn't really happen. Uh, Jerry Lenthi, uh, sociologist and a, a Vietnam veteran himself, he wrote a great book called The Spitting Image. And like, we have these ideas of what happened. And there's, you know, again, certainly please let me know if, if I'm wrong, uh, any, anyone in the audience. Uh, but we have these, you know, these myths that we think happen, you know, not really true by any means. Um, the famous quote from the John Wayne movie, uh, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. And, you know, character says, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. And I think we're used to that because we hear about people jumping out of windows on acid because they can fly and, you know, all these, you know, nightmare stories um, that I don't think is backed up by any literature. So, so my question to you is, you know, regarding safety, um, like how safe are psychedelics? Um, and, and certainly in your experience with ceremonies, um, what does safety look like um, when these uh, practices are being held? So in terms of like a chemical, like physiological side, they're actually, if you compare them to other medications, extremely safe. Um, mm -hmm. There's no addictive properties um, and it's extremely hard to overdose. And if you look at the schedule one scheduling, the, the two criteria is there's no medicinal value and it's highly addictive, which are absolutely false for psychedelics and cannabis for that matter, but that's a different discussion. Uh, so it would be like, I, I'd be impressed if you found a way to overdose from psilocybin or ayahuasca. Uh, you'd have to just consume a tremendous amount. So from that physical, and that if you compare that with SSRIs or even Tylenol, you're going to have more overdoses from Tylenol. There are contraindications, but again, uh, the more we talk about it, the more people who know about this, when we develop systems that prevents that risk from happening, whether it's physical health, you know, heart conditions, or if you're on SSRIs, certain psychedelics are actually, uh, the, 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 can be a dangerous sort of mix. So you would have to have those out of your system. So there are those certain physical sides from a mental health landscape. We're still kind of learning, uh, that side. So certain things like family histories, uh, schizophrenia, certain personality disorders, um, you know, certain major mental health issues uh, should probably steer clear of psychedelics as far as we know right now. Uh, some of that research is starting to change, but if you view a psychedelic almost like a, a chaos factor um, in your brain, so you're introducing sort of this chaos. So if your brain has a good sort of foundation, um, a little bit of chaos is actually healthy. It can kind of mix things up, allow you to reestablish new sort of neural pathways, kind of similar to what they're showing with research now, like fasting. Like when you fast, you put a little positive stress into your body. It allows sort of a, 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 a reshaping of sort of the gut microbiome, all this kind of stuff we're showing that that's healthy. So the same kind of thing, but if you don't have a good foundation, if you already have a loose connection to physical reality, then a psychedelic is probably not the best bet. In terms of specific um, mental health issues, um, that's again, where we're kind of learning as we go. And also, you know, from traditional cultures, they're gonna have different definitions and perspectives on 
mental health and where they stem from, you know, they're not going to find something as PTSD or depression, but they might have similar sort of courses. But what we have seen anecdotally and sometimes backed up by research is that there are indications with different psychedelics being beneficial for broad spectrum. So depression, we show that with psilocybin, they all, they all can work in similar sort of capacities, just maybe a little bit different. Uh, PTSD, um, anxiety, we've seen OCD. There was just a, a Times, a New York Times article that, that linked um, successful results with psilocybin and uh, alcoholism. So other types of addiction, something like Ibogaine has been shown to be very effective for opioid addiction, which is uh, you know very important right now. So across the board, like we're seeing all sorts of benefits, eating disorders. Um, we, the study we did with University of Georgia showed a significant reduction in neuroticism, which is uh, can lead to a lot of other kind of stuff. So this is really opening and there's no other medication right now with mental health that this, you take this medication and it can help a broad spectrum of these things. That's just unheard of. So the very fact that psil psilocybin, for example, can help so many different things uh, is pretty astounding in its own right, but also I think should be a point of humility, a point uh, where we kind of take back and reflect of like, hey, maybe we don't know as much and maybe we should reassess certain things or not have as rigid standards on what we think we know, because that's what's going to take, because this is going to have to reframe, a par this is going to cause a paradigm shift with within this. That being said, uh, you should always use utmost caution. If you have depression, I'm not saying go get a bag of mushrooms and you know, just lock yourself in the bathroom and do it. There's set setting considerations. That's why our program exists. This preparation, uh, proper set and setting, uh, having communal support, all this kind of stuff are absolutely key um, because the common notion of psychedelics is this whole idea of bad trips. Bad trips for way more often than not stem from somebody not knowing the doses, not knowing what they're getting into, not having control over the setting and not understanding how the psychedelic process works. When yeah. we send veterans to this, they might have challenging experience. It's not uncommon for a veteran to say, it was probably the hardest thing they've ever done. And this is after, you know, 15 plus deployments. Uh, but within that, they understand that that challenging experience is where the healing is happening. The mm -hmm. reason why it's so hard is because these are all the compressed emotions that they're having to deal with. And when they get past that sort of friction spot, then that's when they're actually able to process and release a lot of this trauma. And that's where the relief comes from. So when they go in and understand that this, these friction points they actually need to explore that more, instead of like run away and like get into that sort of manic or a hyper state, then that's kind of how you can guide them through that. So all this is what, again, the discussion, the better understanding of how we use these is starting to emerge, but could really uh, be enhanced. And that's partly where policy and laws uh, are, are really the limiting factors. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, you mentioned set and setting. I think Dr. Crowhart in his first book, that's kind of like put me on to that, uh, that idea. And, um, you know, I think it's one thing that I think maybe, maybe, you know, more or less is understood amongst a lot of folks now uh, to be like a huge no-no, if you will, when using psychedelics is doing it alone um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but I think, you know, to kind of flip it, we know things that could, you know, make you not have a great experience. And, and I appreciate that you mentioned that, you know, these aren't like, uh, it's not a panacea. It's not for everyone. Um, you do have to take a few things into consideration. But one thing, um, you know, to go back to dissecting some of those terms I mentioned, um, the idea of, you know, communal healing, um, you know, I, I think, it, you know, I guess basically my question to you is, is communal healing more effective if we know that, you know, doing a lot of these substances solo is definitely, you know, could be detrimental? Is it more healing? And then and what role does the community kind of play in, in this healing process uh, with psychedelics? Uh, from from a research or academic standpoint, it's it's hard to say. You know, I can't, you know, if you're going from that perspective, they're, they're doing studies. For instance, uh, Chris Stoppers over Portland VA is doing uh, some research around psilocybin and group therapy. Um, so it's hard to say in comparison to, to normal therapy. Yeah. Anecdotally, and I would assume, especially with certain groups, that even if you can't prove that the therapy dynamic of, like, for instance, how much the PTSD decreases, I would say broad spectrum it is beneficial. So mm -hmm. I do believe that I think even on the therapeutic side, it's probably beneficial. 
but there's many more elements that might not be fleshed out through, you know, a double line study that, that might come out. And so for instance, let's take a veteran cohort. They already come from this, this very communal sort of um, dynamic, this profession where oftentimes the people I serve with are closer to them than their family. They leave that setting and then they go kind of more in a corporate world, which tends to have more individualism. It doesn't have that same sort of stronghold. They tend to become more isolated because they have to move. And so isolation is a big factor. And so having these veterans come back into groups where, again, they're together, they're self-supporting. And like I said, these can be challenging experiences. So sort of under fire, they're reforming these bonds with these other people that are looking to help themselves. That gives them that sense of community, only uh, accelerated by the, the sense of belonging and community that psychedelics bring. Um, they're also there to support each other. They're also there to see other issues and other people, uh, which can help your own sort of processing. So on that side, I do think it's beneficial because I think veteran or not, one of the things that is exacerbating the mental health crisis is this uh, isolation. You know, in the past, we had much more robust community uh, centers and and community-based organizations that we really don't have anymore. And although technology is helping in some ways, I think it's creating this false sense of community where we really need that in-person accountability uh, that's just not there. Um, and so like, for instance, the VA, with the veterans, this generation of veterans really don't go to the VA. They don't go to the, or the VFW or American Legion uh, where previous generations did. So they're, they're not having this, this, this peer support that they used to have. And so I think psychedelics can bring in um, sort of a new generation of, of community-based systems of health. And the The other thing I'll say on that is we are also having to figure out how to make this more accessible, which current mental health already is not accessible to a lot of groups, a lot sure. of marginalized groups. Mm-hmm. And if we put, if we strictly put psychedelics in a traditional medical model, it's going to still be inaccessible. Those that can't access mental health will still not be able to access mental health. And these modalities will probably prove to be more expensive uh, than just give somebody medication, have them come back in a week. Uh, because the the experiences are longer, you're you're working with it. It really focuses more on the human interaction side as opposed to just the medication side, which the current insurance medical model is not designed around. Mm -hmm. And so if we just leave it to that, it's going to be pretty overwhelmingly expensive. And for instance, what we help out with people getting to these retreats in other countries, you know, a lot of people can't afford that either. That's why our nonprofit exists. Um, and so having these communal access uh, also, one, increases accessibility um, and it uh, makes it more cost effective, too. So we're actually doing a study with Phil Wolfson to do uh, sort of these tiered support systems where we have group ketamine assisted psychotherapy uh, to t- test how it works, how, how successful it is. And if we have that in that group, then that starts making the, the cost model a much more approachable. Yeah, no, that completely makes sense. You brought up a, like a ton of great points there. Uh, you know, we touched briefly on the role, you know, criminalizing substances has had on preventing past and current research efforts, not to mention, of course, all the harm it's caused to countless people. Uh, but as we've seen with alcohol prohibition and most recently the decriminalization and legalization of cannabis throughout the country, legality can can vary, you know, from state to state, often on a county by county level uh, sometimes. Uh, so a question for you, where, where do we currently stand regarding the legality of psychedelics, uh, maybe starting with a micro level view? Yeah, so across the board, they're still all schedule one. So federally, um, that's, like I said, prevented research, but similar to cannabis, it's taken a statewide sort of initiative. Uh, so little by little, some states are doing different policies. Um, so on one end, it's like, for instance, Texas passed a research bill. So that still doesn't allow access, but it's pushing the needle forward where uh, the University of VA are, have funding and are, are uh, pushed to study psychedelics. On the other end of the spectrum, on a statewide basis, uh, places like Oregon passed Measure 109. So at the beginning of next year, you should be able to go to a therapist in Oregon uh, if you're in a certain county and they can prescribe psilocybin uh, to you for various ailments. Uh, so you'll actually be able to access it. Also in Oregon, I think all substances are decriminalized. So it's just, there's no criminal uh, side of it. Uh, Oregon, you know, it's going to be a test case. It's, it's getting a little messy now just because it's the first uh, we've 
are incorporating these, but then everything else is in between. So for instance, Connecticut, we just passed a, a, a bill that's gonna allow for pilot studies. So we're gonna actually be able to start working with these decriminalization bills. It, it kind of prevent, like it's still hard for us to work in places that have decriminalization bills, but it allows individuals and more community organizations to start to surface. And at the very least, you're not at, at you're not fearful of getting arrested just because you have some mushrooms in your possession. So that's kind of the spectrum. And so there, each state is is having a bill, um, and it's starting to increase. New York, we're we're working with some representatives here to see what we can do. Sort of a hybrid where more than the research, we want to have some pilots, uh, but it's not going to be full on legalization. So that's probably what to expect is kind of more of these pilots start bringing it into certain accessible models. Um, and the Biden administration, I think, recently mentioned that they have every intention of figuring out a way to have at least psilocybin and MDMA uh, come about. So that's the other thing. Like I said, MDMA, should, even though not traditional psychedelic, but shown to be very effective in psychotherapy by next year, it should be prescribable uh, because it's passing the FDA. It's more than likely passing the FDA trials. Psilocybin is probably three years behind. So for depression, people should be able to prescribe uh, psilocybin mushrooms in, in uh, about three, four years. Gotcha. And I appreciate that breakdown too, because I, I know a lot has happened pretty quickly and, in, and to your point, you know, it's evolving quickly as well. So a lot of things are coming down the pike. Um, our friend Janine Ferrari has a good question. I, and I, I've heard, so I'll admit, I, I, I'm not sure about this, uh, but I, I've heard that, you know, to your previous point that, you know, this isn't for everyone. There's certain people that, you know, is probably more beneficial or folks, maybe it might not be a great idea to look into. Um, but I, I have heard that like the older you are, that, you know, that could create, I won't say complications, but maybe not be as effective or might not be the best choice. Um, and Janine was was wondering if, if you all focus solely on, uh, you know, all veterans post Vietnam, post 9-11, what does that look like for you all? And can you kind of speak to age being a, a factor? Yeah, we, we so we work with all veterans. Uh, the vast majority that come to us are post 9-11 uh, global war on terrorism vets. Uh, I think just kind of the age and, you know, where they're getting this. But we worked with a handful of Vietnam vets as well. Um, our, our limitations right now, just because of the demand, is uh, trauma related to combat. So combat related trauma and military sexual trauma. So um, those are the two groups, wherever, whatever war, or whatever branch they come from. Um, and so, yeah, we've worked in Vietnam. The, the hardest part is age, and that's kind of more of a health consideration. Um, you know, if they have heart issues, by that time, they might already be on a lot of medications, which can contraindicate with these. Um, but we've, we've seen some pretty good success with, with Vietnam veterans, as long as it's healthy. So we just sent one to a psilocybin retreat, and he had an amazing time, and it really helped him get over, you know, a lot of self-guilt and, and and those are some of the most amazing stories because that generation, if you consider it just because of our lack of effective mental health care, they've been holding on to this trauma for what going on, you know, 40, 50 years. And that, like, I can't imagine that, um, that they've just had to carry this load for, for so long. So we, you know, if we can work with somebody, we absolutely will. Um, there's a lot of different options, uh, fortunately, across the spectrum. So it's really just figuring out what, what works best. So a Vietnam vet, I'm probably not going to send to an Ibogaine retreat because that would be just be heavy hitting, uh, but something a little bit more approachable, like a lighter dose psilocybin could be there or potentially ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. And that's kind of what the model we're trying to establish is it's not, there's not a one-size-fits-all. Uh, let's actually understand where the person's at, what their health situation is at, what they're looking for through this and what they're prepared to, and then kind of work with them and figure out what the best fit is. Cause fortunately there are a lot of different substances, tools, and ways of approaching this. Yeah, absolutely. And it just came to me, uh, Michael Pollan, I think mentioned that in how to change your mind, which is where I remember the age thing, uh, and would recommend folks checking out, uh, that book. Uh, it is great. Um, uh, and, uh, I think you mentioned this, but he has a series on Netflix as well. Uh, probably worth checking. I haven't checked it out yet, but uh, you know, he's a great writer about this stuff. Um, one thing also, I think uh, we're running a little low on time here, um, but you kind of mentioned it, the idea that, you know, we're saying psychedelics, 
but we're really talking about a you know broad spectrum from you know psilocybin to MDMA, um, ibogaine. Um, you know, I can't think of the uh, the toad venom uh, in, in northern Mexico, but all of these are like psychedelics. And when we're talking about toxicity, overdose, effectiveness, uh, we're really talking about a lot of different things. And I and maybe to equate it to something, I feel like you would be saying alcohol when your beer and tequila and whiskey are all completely different things. Um, is it harming us when we're saying psychedelics? Do we just not have the kind of the words to to explain it better, or or is it better to lump some of these um, substances together? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, it's probably going to be both, as as with all great things. <laughs> um, I think right now where we stand, the the hill that we're trying to keep is just reframing the word psychedelic, so there's not the knee jerk reaction, and sure. so. I, I th- there's argument right now that just lumping even MDMA or ketamine, which are not traditional psychedelics into that same sort of vein, just helps us push sort of this platform forward. I do think it could be a disservice uh, down the line. Again, if, if we kind of get in that one size fits all sort of model. Um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I, I think we got to be cautious about it, but for now I think it does have legs just because as with any education campaign or any sort of change in, in mind, uh, the more you explain, the less effective it is. So you kind of have to have sort of the elevator pitch to to get a politician's attention. And so that's sort of the that's sort of the level we're at. Gotcha. Yeah. No. It's that's that's helpful. Uh, and and really appreciate that. Um, I got like one more kind of like a little lightning round question for you. Uh, just to wrap up. Um, so Jesse, you get a magic wand. You get to change anything that would help. Um, you know. Um, I, I think either advocacy or, or the, the forward momentum that, that we've seen with psychedelic usage, what, what's something that you would change to, to make this more accessible or better for folks that uh, are in need of it? So mine would be kind of, so I'll do broader. I think the magic wand would be sort of a, a government focused mandate the same way we had with COVID, you know, how quickly we got the vaccines out. If we had that same sort of thing dealt with mental health and with the lead of psychedelics of like, let's actually spend all our time and focus, but bringing in not politicians, people who have actually been laying the groundwork for this, mm-hmm. I, you could do it. You could do sort of a Kennedy, let's go to the moon kind of thing with mental health mm-hmm. and sort of change the dynamic. Uh, with a veteran scape, I think this is sort of a recurrent pattern, whether it's psychedelics or not. Uh, it's always having, having to be veterans that advocate, never politicians, never the VA. And so whether it's PTSD, Agent Orange, what we're seeing now currently with uh, burn pits, with psychedelics, with mental health, veteran suicide, uh, there needs to be some sort of independent veteran organization that actually advocates and speaks for veterans because otherwise we're going to have to keep doing the same circle where we have to wait and over 10, 20, 30 years, veterans die, veterans struggle until we finally get the attention of a politician that makes the change. So those would be my two things. We need some more effective way for the veteran voice on the ground to be heard. Gotcha. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. We are unfortunately out of time and we'll have to wrap things up now. But Jesse, I truly can't thank you enough for joining us today. I had an excellent conversation. Could have kept going the rest of the afternoon, but hope everyone in the audience found this discussion as insightful and enjoyable as I did. I'd like to quickly give a shout out to my colleague, Stephanie Fong, for all the behind the scenes work uh, to make this happen. It's greatly appreciated. And of course, all our attendees, thank you all for joining us today. I hope you all enjoyed the webinar and will be joining us next Monday, the 19th for an event I'm super excited about that we'll be discussing the findings from a new report by NY Health focused on food insecurity in New York State. And stay tuned for an announcement about another great event we'll be having in a few weeks where we'll be discussing telehealth and specifically how navigators can support patients seeking care virtually. So keep an eye out for that. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at NYH Foundation and myself at Class B. Sign up for our newsletter on our website if you haven't already for more details. And thanks again to our amazing guest, Jesse Gould, for joining us today. And thank you all for joining and participating this afternoon. Hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thanks, Derek. Thank you.